I am here to talk about interactive pacing. We're going to do it by talking about The Last of Us Part 2. So, let's talk about pacing. And when I say let's talk about pacing, let's not talk about graphs. We don't need these graphs. We don't need any of this at all. Instead, the way I'm going to approach this talk is that we're going to treat pacing like running. So, as the person going through a story, you're the one setting the rhythm, the tempo, the actual speed that the story happens. We try to give that to the player in Last of Us Part Two. And I also might maybe talk about one graph. Like, like just, just, just one, just this one in particular. It's not really the same as the others, I totally promise. Uh, but we'll kind of dig into that and you'll see what I mean. But uh, yeah, uh, before I get ahead of myself, uh, who am I? Uh, so my name is Evan Hill. Uh, I was a level designer at Naughty Dog, working on Last of Us Part Two. Currently, I'm at Obsidian, working on Outer Worlds 2. Uh, I also did a bunch of other games, but the main thing we're here to talk about, obviously, is The Last of Us Part Two, uh, And even more specifically, the museum flashback scene. So this was one of the main things I worked on at my time in Naughty Dog, and one of my favorite things I've ever like, made, ever. Uh, I think it really connected with people, and I credit a lot of that to this approach that we took, kind of allowing people to set the tone for themselves, set the pace for themselves, and like, the results kind of speak for themselves. Shout out to Gene Park, and I apologize for maybe ruining his shirt. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I just want to kind of share this process, this uh, weird approach that I haven't really seen talked about as much in you know, branching narrative focus games, which has been a passion of mine for just decades. So uh, let's kind of get a quick overview. Uh, first, we're going to start with the where and why. Then we're going to go into this three-part uh, breakdown of how like the core content of interactive pacing and story kind of works, and specifically in this level. And then we're going to dive into the extra spicy stuff about what I call secrets. They're a little different than what you might think. And then I'm going to cover a little bit of like how I actually did it. And then I'm going to have an hour-long talk in the Level Design Summit tomorrow if you want that, but for an hour. Uh, but let's jump into it. Uh, first things first, where and why? So, as I kind of talked about before, the goal with this level was to have a player-tuned experience. Uh, you figure out the rhythm that works for you. I don't want to outstay my welcome for even a second, because given as we'll see what this level is, if I overstay my welcome as a designer, if we overstay our welcome as a team, it's going to just collapse like a house of cards. It's going to get boring. So what do you need to do this? Well, that one graph I talked about. Uh, this is a four-part four story breakdown uh, that is really common in Asian literary traditions. Ki, sho, ten, kets. Real easy way to understand it is it's the anatomy of interesting events. It's really straightforward. First, you have the introduction. You let the audience understand what's going on. You take those ideas and you develop them. You set more stakes. You add more complications. You then take all of that tension, twist it about, give it new stuff, rattle them around. That's your climax, that's your payoff. And finally, you have a conclusion. Like I said, it's not too complicated, but the best way to think about this is not like those previous graphs, like some kind of magic formula, but as the anatomy of interesting events. This works for analyzing everything from a baseball game to a meet cute between you and somebody else to just what makes a good story that you want to tell your friends? Even a good tweet, even a good joke. Um, a good example of it being used in some places you might expect is like the Mario series currently. Uh, this is the cornerstone of their level design. It's this four-part breakdown. Uh, Mark Brown does an amazing job explaining this more in depth uh, on his channel, uh, Super Mario World 3D's uh, four-step level design. Uh, but yeah, me personally, the best place I learned about this uh, format and this process is from Manga in Theory and Practice by Hirohiko Araki. Yes, that is a JoJo's reference. <laughs> Um, but yeah, literally there's like a couple pages in this book that trump almost every book on writing I've ever read. I'm not saying that lightly. But uh, yeah, main thing to take away right now is we're not going to be talking about this as a graph. It is just the anatomy of interesting events. So going from that, we can kind of understand that we're not just talking about optional content or side quests or collectibles. This is something that's more fundamental to the moment-to-moment -moment experience that the player has. Like, this includes things like 
how immersive sims allow you to approach different situations, how puzzles work. You know, looking at the system we had, you get introduced to the mechanics, the mechanics complete and develop, you have an aha moment, you solve the puzzle. It's very, very universal. Even RPG leveling systems, we're not talking about dialogue systems, I'm talking about the fact that you get that one piece of your build, fundamentally changes how the way you play, move on to the next level. So even without challenging mechanics, we can give the player tools to shape their experience. And now, why are we focusing on this level in particular? Why, why this specific part of The Last of Us? It's a really brutal game, honestly. It has some really amazing combat, but we also cared a lot about creating a lot of human moments, things that focus on character and rhythm, and I think the, the museum level is where we took that the furthest. Uh, so, as an overview, like this level has no combat or stealth, doesn't use any of the core mechanics that we had previously. It's mostly dialogue. And critically of all, uh, the reason I wanted to bring it up in this talk today, it's totally linear for the most part. There's no branching story, there's no alternate endings, and yet we still worked to, again, create this interactive experience, this interactive pacing. So the big goal for me, as I mentioned already, was perfect timing. I wanted to reward the people who wanted to linger and enable the people that wanted to rush. So we had to create systems so that both of these radically different spectrums of players could have a compelling time. How do we do that? Oh, <laughs> jumped the gun. Um, the first and most critical part is what I call focal points. These are the important and unmissable parts of your experience. Literally, your whatever it is, leveling system, level, story, moment, combat encounter, should be complete with all of these and literally nothing else. Anything in addition to these, if it makes the story worse, it needs to be added to this list. Um, and finding out which one of these moments work and like how to build these moments goes back to this anatomy. So we're gonna go through an example of what these moments were in this level and kind of roughly talk about how it fits to this structure. So for those that maybe don't know or need a refresher, the uh, flashback level starts three years in the past Joel is just messing with Ellie. Like they've taken out and gone into the wilderness. He has not explained why. It's her birthday. She starts asking what the hell his surprise is gonna be. And in response, he shoves her into the river. <laughs> Which is extra shocking if you played the first game because we have not established that Ellie can swim yet. <laughs> so as the player, you are now underwater and we teach you the swimming mechanics in the game that we added. And as that big twist, you know, set up, develop, twist, Ellie already learned how to swim. She's actually great, and you're totally safe. And then they just quip at each other and continue on. That's the first kind of arc. The next part is you move further into the forest, and Joel does actually reveal what his big ass surprise is gonna be. Turns out, it's a fucking dinosaur. He has brought Ellie all the way out to the remains of the Wyoming National History Museum, and her brain just fucking explodes. Uh, they then get to explore the museum, and as we're kind of gonna dig in, that's where a lot of this really interactive stuff comes in. We did not want that part to be too long or too short for the player, so that when the final payoff happens, it's gonna land. Like, Joel, in addition to just taking her here, uh, knows about her love of space, and has gotten a recording of the Apollo launch, and then hands it to her into the middle of an authentic space capsule and just gives her this perfect moment where, yeah, she can imagine that the world's gonna be a better place, that it's gonna go back to the way that it was. They both get to share in that. They both kind of align in that single moment. Again, set up, develop, payoff, conclusion. And then finally, because Ellie is also, you know, riding this high, really generally curious, she wants to see more of this museum, this amazing place that Joel's taken her. Unfortunately, uh, she winds up getting lost in the last annex, totally alone, gets attacked by a boar, and then also finds a bunch of graffiti referring to the fireflies, the one thing that they're still not really talking about. And the relationship starts to unravel from there. Again, set up, develop, twist, payoff. But as we pointed out, this is just the high level beats. This is the most condensed that this story is. You know, as I told it right there, it's not it's fine, like you guys get it, but you know, I don't see anybody crying. So how does the player seek out more? How do they add and kind of season this experience with more of what they want out of it? 
And that brings us to prospects. So prospects are these exact added things. For other games, it might be like side quests or optional encounters, um, you know, dungeons. Like a Skyrim prospect would just be a dungeon. But the most important thing to take away of what a prospect is in this format is they are clear options. These are not hidden things. These are not special things you have to search for. You can see them, you get them. You give the player a bite and then let them decide how many to take. The idea is if you have a set of prospects, they all should take the same amount of time. It doesn't matter if it's about 10 seconds or an hour of content. The player needs to know what they're getting into in order to do this thing that we're talking about, season their experience. All of you have probably done similar things. Like everybody's playing Elden Ring right now. You can look at the map and be like, all right, cool, that's a boss fight. I'm gonna go somewhere else. But in this level in particular, we tried to showcase this as best we could. Um, so early on in the museum, we just have one little skeleton, one dinosaur to mess with. You're able to walk up, you see and interact. Ellie has a little quip, Joel has a response. Great, you could also skip this. That's why we put a second one in the next hallway. Again, you can interact with it, Ellie does a little quip, Joel responds, great. And then you turn the corner and you see this, a whole cornucopia of these weird little moments. And by that point, without having to say anything, without a tutorial, without anything else, as a player, you're able to look at this and be one of two things. Cool, moving on, or I will do every single one of these. <laughs> and, and that's what we allowed for. Like everything that seemed interesting, everything we felt that needed to be said or could be done, we just piled on and on. And even more importantly though, is for those first group of people, you can have whatever opinion you want about them, um, it's also clear how to move on. There's this big staircase in the back. When they walk up, they really like make it clear, like, oh hey, we're moving to something else. And then we also put a hard valve, a hard a level design term where you can't go back to just signal, hey, once you move past here, there's no backtracking, there's no nothing, or you wanna go. So again, you give the player a bite, you let them decide how many to take. And kind of going back to our format, uh, this is kind of the first half of the equation. You know, I'm setting the player up, I'm developing it, we're stretching that second part to be as long as they want. You know, it goes right up until the point where you get to say like, eh, I'm done. All right, like, this is cute, but what else you got? And that comes to the second half of the graph, where we answer the other question that kind of comes with this format, which is, cool, we've got prospects, but how do you keep it from being repetitive? Like, I, I'm literally telling you to be repetitive. Be consistent. Okay, uh, it's kind of boring. So how do we spice that up? That's where these uh, things I'm calling threads come in. Like, it's a bad name, I don't know. Um, but the main thing I wanna talk about is how it uses this ancient tool used by an illustrious group, improv actors. <laughs> what we need to do when we're dealing with uh, prospects is yes and the player. Anytime you interact with one of these things, anytime you go about this, there should be, again, we don't wanna be predictable, there should be a decent chance that we're gonna take it and we're gonna run with it. We're gonna yes and it and we're gonna throw it back. It's pretty straightforward. Again, believe it or not, this is kind of similar to what we're talking about already. Uh, you take the player action, you react to it, and then when you build a thread, you expand and you throw it back. So, yeah, like I said, it's the same formula we've been talking about here, but it's that back half. It's that extra layer where the player's like, oh, cool, this is gonna be a 30 second interaction. Oh, wait, it's a 40 second interaction. Oh, wait, that's a joke. Oh, my God, this is memorable suddenly. Uh, so, yeah, it's the back half of this graph. Um, the yes and prospects. So let's look at some examples in the level. So one of the early prospects we kind of give is, is the fucking hat. Simple thing, Does you know, seems a little innocuous. Ellie picks it up, she says a quip, Joel reacts, great. You know, she thinks it looks great, he thinks it looks lame, but then we also let you mess with it. All of a sudden, like you see this interactable, and kind of ask yourself like, what, what the fuck is this? No, 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 no. Yes. Yes and. Yes and Joel hates it. Yes and you can put the hat on Joel as well. Yes and he then gets into it and just delivers a super wholesome moment that you only get if you lean into it. 
You only get if you engage with the prospects. We reward you. We take in and listen and say like, all right, cool, I see what you're doing. I'm gonna add, I'm gonna react, I'm gonna yes and. And, and this works for moments and connections, big and small. Uh, it, it brings that sequence to life, you know? Everyone listening around, like you heard laughter there. Like that's the thing that we're talking about. It's that little bit of surprise, that little bit of twist that goes it from being repetitive to something interesting. Um, you know, so like some small examples are like, as you're talking, Ellie and Joel can just start talking about Jurassic Park. And it just keeps developing until like, oh, they're actually gonna watch this movie. You know, he promises her, they move on. Uh, you can actually sit in the space section and just have Ellie just fire truck or fire hose about space for like six different interactions and just keep going. And again, like this, it doesn't have to be these big moments. Uh, brings the sequences to life. It's this back half of the structure. But can we take it further? How do we ratchet this up to 11? How do we make these types of moments really stick out? And that's where we get to secrets. These are the mold breakers. So threads build off of prospects. You think you know what you're getting into, we kind of give you 50% more. It's a good way to think about it. This stuff just catches you by surprise. This is the stuff that does not follow a pattern, does not actually like, sit with what the player's expectation is, and it's how you make something memorable. They're memorable departures. These aren't hidden collectibles. These are just twist on twist on twist. It makes the player feel like anything's possible if they lean in. The other thing to be kind of careful about is like these are not the focal points. Do not be afraid to let the player miss it out. If they care, they'll hear about it. Like these need to be moments that are big and interesting but can be completely optional. Do not need to be a part of the story. So like a really clear example that I'm not only just really happy about but like how it came about was great, was the first time we showed the leads, uh, one of the early mock-ups of this level, one of them just chimed in, first millisecond. Can I climb that? And then we did. And this is something that like, I'm sure even a lot of people who play the game might have totally missed, but have heard about. Like, uh, the constant reaction I always see with this is like, wait, what, you could do that? What the fuck? It has this whole interaction, Ellie's able to get on top, she fucking jumps down. Uh, and yeah, for the people that engage with it, they're, they're on cloud nine. They're, they're like, what the hell else is here? For the people that didn't engage with it, if they still liked it, they come back and they're like, wait, what the fuck else is there? <laughs> you know, but it's also smaller things. Like Ellie can find this mirror in the bathroom and then we just give you this whole freaking mini game where you're able to just pose her face and look like a doofus because you just get to be her for a moment. You get to mess around. You actually get to find out that, oh, hey, you can and put hats on Joel. There's an achievement for that. And you know, and then this is kind of like the, the borderline between them, thread, threads and secrets. This is like a little hat moment. Um, you know, other small things, like you can find this pallet off in the river. She quips at Joel, like, oh, hey, let's, <laughs> let's ride on this. Like, totally optional. But, uh, but yeah, it, the main goal is like, it makes players feel like anything's possible. It keeps them from just kind of condensing down and just, consuming your content like it's uh, predictable. But that's all nice. I've given you guys a good framework. How do? How do we find these moments? We talk a lot about scripts and planning and structure, but in like my decade of doing this, the only thing I can honestly say is just iteration. Like, it's writing. We're telling stories. Good writing is rewriting. And Specifically with the approach of Last of Us, we uh, kind of took the approach of storyboarding more than script writing. And if anybody here knows about storyboards, they also kind of know how rough they can be. And that's a really critical part of why they work. This is an example of a storyboard from Knives Out. <laughs> Soak it in. <laughs> they did not care about making this look good. They just wanted to know if this would be interesting or funny. And hey, that scribble's pretty funny. And this, this like extends to a lot of other medium. Like, guess who drew this? Look, look at this mess. This is by Hirohiko Araki. <laughs> this guy's been in the Louvre. This is how he sketches his, his ideas out. You wanna see what the dinosaur looked like the first time I put it in? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
this is what one of the leads looked like and said, I want to climb it. <laughs> and so we did. And, and like all of this is really critical because like we didn't know if this moment would work. I had no idea whether like we were even gonna keep this dinosaur or all these other things. I wanted to get it done in 20 minutes and just show someone. And after putting it in front of them, seeing they wanted to climb it, I'm like, all right, cool, we can move forward with this. This is doable, this is workable. This is something we can put this much effort into instead of spending a couple months and then deciding, eh. But that's like, that's the generative part. But how do you, how do you also like, I don't know, vibe with it? How do you build that iteration? How do you discover stuff? And that's where I think like another thing we don't talk about enough is inspiration. So for me, working on this project was a huge challenge. Like there's, there's none of the guardrails that we normally feel as designers. No core combat, no nothing, all dialogue. And I got super lucky because then I suddenly found the work of one Naoko Yamada. Uh, this is a Japanese anime film director. Uh, she is just a master. She's on par with Hao Miyazaki. Not mincing words here. Um, she mostly works with Kyoto Animation, and all of her films are the kind of subtle, beautiful stuff that uh, makes me cry every fucking time. And if you even like my work a little bit, check every single one of these things out. I'm, I'm dead serious. Uh, but another thing we were looking at, too, was um, Firewatch. Again, had a really similar structure to what we were doing. So just, just the fact that I'd interacted with this game years ago, as I was starting to chew on this problem, I was able to break down, like, oh, hey, this kind of interactive pacing is like what they did. Like I could decide to kind of live in a moment or do these types of things. It didn't do any hard branching. We didn't need to have a big payoff. Just these little things that let you kind of linger in a moment really add a lot. And then the final thing is like in addition to it's like, okay, we know what we're trying to do. We know where we're getting our input. How do we get this on the page? How do we actually figure these moments out? Honestly, we just kind of improv it. Uh, the way we worked was uh, we would have a short outline. I would do something horrible like that dinosaur we did earlier, and we would literally act it out together as like a, a strike team. And yeah, no, I wish I wish I had footage of this. They would never let me. Sh they would never let me show any of this. But we're talking like uh, when you get hit by the boar, me or one of the leads would literally like tumble onto the floor, roll around like ah, it's got to feel like this just to see if these rhythms, if these emotions are valid. Like if we're able to sell it, then maybe we can get the player invested into it. If I can't sell it, if I can't make it interesting, even with like all my energy, like maybe it's a bad beat. Maybe it doesn't work. Um, and then that feeds back into like, oh, we're using all of these tools. Like we're using improv and um, you know, finding out what works for us by looking at other media. And we just gave it to the player. Like that's the other way to think about it. Like find what works for you. Like don't, don't worry about like copying my formula or looking for graphs, but just get in tune with what makes it fun for you and then try to make that thing happen to the player. We're interactive, like we can do that. But uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, looks like we're actually gonna have some time for questions, which I'm really excited about. But uh, yeah, you know, follow me on Twitter. We've got a website and stuff. Uh, also have some stuff on the horizon on the side, doing some audio drama with some cool people. And uh, yeah, check out my stuff on Outer Worlds too. And also watch Listen to Bluebird and Silent Voice and the Hakey Story. They're all real, 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 real good. Uh, we do have time for questions. Hi, great talk. Thank um, you. So I want to know about prospects in relation to threads and secrets, because prospects, thread and secrets all have like some aspects that are in common mm -hmm. in that they are like, for instance, a thing in the environment that you can walk up to and press triangle on. But all prospects should be roughly the same like size. Correct. So does that mean that if you have too many threads, threads and secrets can break the size rule. So does that mean that you can screw your like you, bread you, flower ratio up by having too many threads and secrets and not enough prospects? Absolutely correct. Like that, that I think hits to the core of 
the balancing act. And like one of the things that like I can't solve for, you solve it for your content as it comes to it. But that's exactly what we're kind of getting to. Even back to the key shot then cats, the big part is that unpredictability. You want a little bit of it. You want a little bit of consistency with your prospects. But then if you're just threading all your prospects, you're just back to having prospects. You're just doing the same thing over again. You have a list of side quests of all equal length, size, and weight, and it doesn't feel good. But yeah, finding that ratio, I can't give you like a rough estimate or anything else like that, but no, what you said is you're on exactly the right wavelength to be asking those questions. Cool, thanks. Hello. Thank you very much for the talk. Thank you. Um, I'm curious, uh, as a level designer, I do a lot of work like this. Um, maybe you're gonna cover this in your talk tomorrow, so maybe mm -hmm. it's a good segue. To come, come to my to talk tomorrow. That. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, what, wh how do you build this in the earliest stages when you're stubbing it out? You showed that one image. Mm -hmm. This whole thing is full of moments that essentially won't sell the way they will in the finished product until like way at the end of development. Mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you actually stub in things like the hat and things like that early on? Do you use like storyboards or, or, or title cards? What do you use? So we would normally like get this kind of jank in engine walking around. And then as I kind of touched on, we would just act it out. Like I use my physicality. We like, I would play Joel. One of the leads would play Ellie or vice versa. And we would try and like feel out the dialogue and just talk through it. Like the, the, the hats literally just came from a stupid joke I did where it was like, oh, you know, maybe she finds a stupid hat. Oh, maybe she puts it on a saber tooth tiger. It got a really big laugh that I wasn't expecting. And then all of a sudden I'm like, okay, we're going to do this. And yeah, from there in the talk tomorrow, we'll kind of dive into what are the next steps of like, how do you actually build a playable prototype? How do you shift that to production? How do you polish something like this? And all of the processes and stuff in that iteration cycle. The big answer for that is have a really, really competent team and keep them on track and it can work out. Cool, thanks. Hello, my name's Ethan. I'm a narrative and level design student. That's my voice, that's weird. Um, <laughs> So um, if you're able to talk about it, uh, can you talk about any like components of this story that you all tried that didn't work and why those didn't work and why they didn't end up making it in the game? Oh, you mean so stuff that got cut or yeah. just didn't work out? Um, I think like somewhat vaguely. Um, so like the other flashback that I worked on, the one where Ellie and Joel go to um, the hotel and then fight the bloater. Um, initially, they were gonna find the strings. Like, they, they're like, oh, we're gonna set out, we're gonna try and like find these strings. It's gonna be a metaphor for repairing our relationship. And then we dialed it back when both for scope of like, oh, hey, like this is a whole third of the level that we don't wanna make. And then right when we were asking that question, we're like, oh, they don't find the strings. That means they don't repair their relationship. It spirals out. So it was actually like a thing where cutting that element, we then looked you know, through our story uh, framework and analyze it and said like, oh, all of a sudden this actually makes it better. This, this develops, so like cutting down the rhythms and the, in the outline stage, like we didn't get very far. Uh, we kind of got to like the playable prototype of like the, the uh, music store. A couple times we looked at it and like, this, this, is too, this is too much, this is too complicated. Cut it, level's now two thirds as long. And the reason we went really fast and forward with that was because we realized, oh, hey, makes the story work better. Awesome, thank you. Mm -hmm. Hello. Hello. Um, I'm Paris. Um, you talk a lot about unpredictability, um, and I'm curious how you balance unpredictability with player intentionality, making sure that players are doing actions for you know a reason that they actually know of, um, and especially with you know The Last of Us, it's like you know, I see a prompt and I might not necessarily know what that leads to. Um, so if you could speak to that. Yeah, so we kind of covered it a little bit in this talk. Um, the uh, initial two exhibits that Ellie kind of sees in isolation, that's, the, that's exactly what we're attempting to do there, where neither of those have, you know, big threads attached to them. There's no like big yes and. And by doing two at once, we're simultaneously letting the player like, oh, hey, you can skip things. Oh, hey, these things are evolved equal size, um, and it keeps us from like lowering the amount of people that go without touching anything before they get to the main room. So again, it's, it's a light touch there, but in general, like that's where that four part structure you can kind of break down and understand with. It's like that development part, uh, that first half 
of like setup and development, that's why you kind of want to do it in order. That's where like you don't just want to go big twist, big twist, big twist, because they, they weren't expecting anything. Because the, the unpredictability, the subtle part of it is it needs to happen after they start forming predictions. So you do the, you do the things that set their ex expectations first, and then you do the crazy stuff. And like that constant flow back and forth is what generates that feeling of story, of like experience, the ahas, the oh shits, or the oh no. Thank you. Hello, friend. Hello. Uh, I have a question related to uh, secrets and threads, uh, secrets in particular because you said that it's okay if people miss them. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess I'm wondering if after the fact, uh, how much data collection or studying did you do to, to basically get an idea of, for particular secrets, what percentage of players actually found them and uh, how did that impact uh, your uh, mental model for how you approach these kinds of things in the future of like, I wanna go into a secret, but last time I did, only 20% of the people found it. Mm. Do those things kind of factor into your decision making? Uh, that's just more of that. Yeah, so uh, it kind of comes out in iteration. Uh, we did a lot of play testing on the game and say for example, the dinosaur climbing, uh, I forget what the exact number really was, but we, in conceptualizing like this, we're honestly happy if like 10, 20% of people got it. Like, and we just ate that content scope. We felt that like having that quality was there. Now there were times in playtesting where that was not the number that we were hitting, so we would do things like uh, increase the affordances around that, some like just basic level design getting thrown at it where we made it more clear, we made it look more like a ramp, we highlighted it more, we had Joel walk by it more to just kind of nudge and nudge and nudge until we felt it was like a little more consistent. Uh, I don't know the final ship numbers, but yeah, when we did a Game Maker's Toolkit on this level, like one of the common comments was like, wait, what, you can climb the dinosaur? And yeah, it looks like we might be out of time, everybody, but I think I'll be in the wrap-up room, and yeah, thank you so much.